So welcome. This um this is our second striving for equity workshop. Uh, I am Corinne. I'm the person that has been emailing you, and I know many of the names on this call. I'm really excited to see you here because I think this is going to be uh, really helpful. Just I'm going to start with the just a few housekeeping things. Um, this, as I said, is our second Striving for Equity workshop. The Stri Striving for Equity project has allowed us to um, offer um, support and resources for housing committees and community groups doing advocacy around housing. Uh, this, the in addition to our workshops, we have been doing our housing committee drop-in, which has been a really exciting social space for uh, housing committee members and. Uh, other adjacent housing advocates to uh, talk about some of the policies that they're working on, some of the things they're struggling with, what they'd like to see, what they'd like to know more about. Um, and just kind of from a personal pr perspective, it's been um, really uh, exciting and um, has bringing me a lot of hope to see other people, uh, housing committee members kind of teaching each other about the field. That's been really great to see. Um, as a reminder, uh, our all of our uh, workshops, not our drop-ins, but our workshops are recorded. Uh, we are putting them on our Striving for Equity um, kind of toolkit website, which I'm going to be putting in the chat right here. Oop. That uh, I just switched from a Mac to a Windows, so I always get my shortcuts mixed up. Um, so you can find uh, the past recordings and at the end of this workshop uh, on this uh, toolkit, as well as our calendar of events and some other resources that have uh, come up in our workshop. The other thing I just wanna turn your attention to is that we have some really exciting opportunities coming up for April. April is Fair Housing Month and the Fair Housing Project um, loves the opportunity to partner with communities across the state to uh, further our housing education, especially around uh, housing inclusion in the Fair Housing Act. And this year we have the, um, the privilege of partnering with the Human Rights Commission to invite Richard and Leah Rostein up to Vermont, which is huge, to talk about their um, most recent book, Just Action. So we have a lot of um, activities that will be kind of coming up in a in, um, preceding the event and coming up after the event, including um, I'm hearing rumors of a book group. Um, all to say that uh, keep your eye on the email. I'm going to be promoting um, I'm going to be promoting these events. Uh, just, oops, this is me using the wrong shortcut again. I'm glad this is recorded so I can relive this. Um, I'm putting our Striving for Equity website in the chat. And then as a reminder, I know I've said this a few times in my emails, please add fhp at cboeo.org to your address book. Uh, if um, if you haven't, you might not be receiving uh, some of our newsletters, which come in through MailChimp. So um, just take a minute at the end of this workshop, perhaps you're multitasking and add us to your address book. Uh, with that said, um, I'm trying to think if I forgot anything. I might just circle back and say, once again, I'm Corinne. I'm here with the CVOEO Fair Housing Project at Champlain Valley of Economic Opportunity. Uh, we have we are welcoming Emily Heyman, uh, the senior planner of the town of Williston for our second Striving for Equity um, workshop. Um, and so I'm gonna turn this mic to you, Emily, otherwise I will talk right through this workshop. Thank you, Corinne. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, nice to meet everybody. Uh, my name's Emily. Um, I started out with the town of Williston in 2017, um, entry level planning technician. Um, currently, I'm senior planning, um, senior planner, um, and also recently deputy zoning administrator. Although I'd call, not sure zoning administration is a promotion or a demotion. Um, it can be fun and challenging. Um, my role is wide ranging for the town. So I staff the development review board, um, looking at development proposals, helping um, draft their decisions. Um, I help review administrative permits. So I'm helping citizens from someone who's never gotten a shed permit before or is building their home um, to working with 
developers and engineers and professionals on big projects, major developments. Um, so both ends of the spectrum. Um, and also long range planning, uh, assisting with the planning commission, uh, staffing our historic and design advisory commission, um, as well as um, assisting with the select board as needed. So my role is both current planning with permit review um, from large to small projects uh, to long range planning with um, writing and revising the bylaws. Right now we're working on our town plan project um, and some of our advisory committees. Um, so my presentation presentation today is called Get It Done, uh, Community Get Engagement for Municipal Decisions. Uh, some of my examples and um, stories and uh, that I'll share are based on my experience, um, but also some of my experience with my coworkers. Um, every, most projects are the result of a good team effort. Uh, so a little bit about the town of Williston. Um, most folks, have, I assume, have probably visited our town. Um, we're population a little over 10,000 people. Uh, we're 10 minutes to the airport, 20 minutes to downtown Burlington. Um, and we're in Chittenden County, so the fastest growing um, county in our state um, with a lot of jobs and employment opportunities and also a great need for housing. Uh, Williston's seen a lot of change. So like most of Vermont, it has an agrarian rural history um, in the 1980s, being located on intersection of two state highways and the Interstate 89 um, became a place where development was desirable. Um, we've seen a lot of change over the past 30 years. Um, and we're going through our ugly duckling, our suburban retrofit phase. So transitioning from strip malls, parking lot forward development, um, single use commercial buildings to trying to retrofit in a downtown walkable pattern, um, more housing, um, more mixed use buildings. Um, this suburban retrofit photo is the newly constructed LL Bean in Williston. Um, the building is pulled to the street. It has a 10 foot wide multi-use path along it. Um, and the Cisco truck is using the bike pedestrian path for loading. So we're seeing that sometimes challenges of we're trying to make it a walkable place, but um, the rest of the world is trying to evolve to it. The Cisco truck now knows to use the parking lot on the other side. Um, so our agenda for today's meeting, I'm going to go over some of the tools in my toolbox, um, why I use them, and several case studies um, explaining some of my tips and tricks. Uh, so it's in my toolbox. Some things are free, like Google, Google Forms, um, Google Survey. Um, I do recorded PowerPoint sometimes. Um, I'm not a video editor by any means. Um, Mentimeter um, for surveying. Parkit Project Journals, which is um, basically a Google form um, and some note cards I'll go into in the future. Infographics, decision templates, and my words of wisdom. Um, my focus here is that my tools that I try to use are either free or included in my existing Microsoft package or something that's not crazy expensive. Um, we're municipalities or nonprofits with limited budgets, so we need to be judicious with what we use. Uh, so why have a toolbox? Um, time and, ten and attention are our most precious resources. And it's important to keep decision makers focused on facts, not on emotions. And in general, after about two hours of a meeting or things going past 9 p.m. at night, it can be really hard to um, think clearly, make good decisions, especially when you're in nitty gritty of working on a bylaw amendment or drafting a development decision. Um, so it's important to use our time efficiently. Um, and our boards and committees, um, when you add it all up, for example, a planning commission that meets two times a month, 12 months a year, that's about 48 hours. So you have, throughout an entire year, very little meeting time, um, and you need to allocate it judiciously. And those 48 hours a year um, can easily be diverted to random tangents. Um, we're working on big concepts and big ideas. People have a lot of passions. It's a lot of yes and solutions. Um, so how do we keep random tangents from um, taking over? 
Uh, so the first example is the Williston Energy Plan. This was adopted in September of 2020, so a little while ago. Um, and it was an amendment to our comprehensive plan doing our required um, energy plan. So there's things that we were required to do by the state um, for substantial deference. And then our energy committee and our planning commission went above and beyond. It had major focus areas from transportation and land use, recycling, agriculture. So broad ranging focus, a lot of places where tangents and passions could take over. Um, so how did we address that? Um, I constructed a pre-meeting survey. So I took all of the statements in the energy plan um, and had our planning commission do a survey. You either agree with it as written um, or you give a recommendation for to change it. Uh, you'll notice that no is not an option. Um, and this is Google Forms, which is free. I looked at the responses and then was able to determine from the planning commission, where's their consensus, where's their friction? The topics where no one had any um, feedback or everybody was in agreement, we're not even gonna talk about that in the public meeting, um, or we'll talk about it very briefly at the end. Where there were places of friction or a lot of feedback, we're gonna prioritize talking about those town plan goals and policies first. Some of it was just, nuanced language changes um, rather than creating a program, exploring a tiered program. So using the feedback from that survey to broaden language and present something to the planning commission in their meeting. So we're not spiraling out um, in the meeting. Um, here's another example where, you know, increase allowable density. That was a really hot button issue. Um, our goal here is to get an energy plan and get our substantial benefits uh, deference through. So we just change the wording to, you know, in the future, reevaluate density. Um, a big takeaway from energy plan, so all of that feedback from the survey was there is a missing link. Um, oftentimes municipalities, we have very little control over, you know, state or national um, influences that are affecting our town. So we added a third pathway to our energy plan to monitor state and federal policies, um, proactively participate in legislative process. For example, ideas would be thrown out like, hey, why don't we put a local option sales tax on, on gas? It's like, well, municipalities don't have the authority to do that. And we didn't want our commissioners to feel like their ideas were we're wrong or being ignored, but just recognize that there's a greater context to what a municipal government can and can't do. And here's how we can um, take that pathway forward and address those concerns. Uh, so for energy plan, I used Google Forms and I created de decision templates. So our planning commission would be talking not about, do you wanna change the language in this yes or no, but what language do you want to change and what words do you want to use? So we're having a much higher focused conversation in that limited meeting time. Um, second example was um, part of our form-based code project. So in fall of 2022, Williston adopted a form-based code after a very lengthy uh, public process. Um, and we did hire an outside consultant to help us draft the form-based code but we as staff did a lot of shepherding it through our planning commission, um, some of our public outreach and engagement. And I'm really gonna focus on, after we had done our community um, engagement, um, our public surveys, that kind of thing, I'm gonna focus on getting the planning commission, working through the draft and transmitting something to the select board for approval. So we had a lot going on in form base code. We're developing whole new design standards. And maybe one night we're talking about architectural standards, but someone read the parking chapter and has a lot of questions and comments on the parking chapter. So we had a park it journal where if something came up either during a meeting or one of our planning commission members sent us a question or comment, rather than just checking it off in our heads, we had a shared uh, Google Doc to keep track of ideas and then respond to them. Oftentimes there would be ideas or questions brought up that we couldn't, we don't have the authority as a municipality to include in our zoning or 
weren't going to be addressed in the form-based code uh, bylaw package, but we didn't want to forget about them. So we used the Parkett Journal to show that the planning commissioners were being heard, responding to them with facts and data where appropriate um, and keep track. Um, so after the planning commission reviewed their first draft um, of the code and was ready to warn a public hearing, um, they held a hearing and there were about 10 things that they felt like we want to tweak before we get send this on to the select board. And each one of these 10 things could have probably been a meeting of its own. Um, and we needed to be really efficient with our timeline um, to move this project forward to the select board. So we broke it down into these 12 or these 10 topic areas and did a PowerPoint video, which is not going to win any, you know, Grammys or Oscars or whatever, but it helps convey to the planning commission and it made it possible for us as staff to remind them of all their um, process, what the code says, what the facts are around the issue that they're topic that they're concerned about. Um, and we would talk over PowerPoint slides and then they would be able to watch it or listen to it on their own time. An example was building height, um, building height in the different form-based code areas. So we summarized what they all the building heights were proposed to be, um, how it corresponds to the regulating map of the form-based code, um, reminded them of the testimony that they heard throughout the public hearing process, um, an excerpt of what the existing building heights are um, in the bylaw. Um, some of my graphic design in this era is not super great, but it works. Um, and reminding them about their public process. What did the vision plan say about affordable housing and height, building heights, energy and environment, um, taxes? And going back to the energy plan. So our energy plan has some standards for uh, the bylaw as well. Um, and then we brought this to um, a Mentimeter survey question. So rather than having the planning commission members dialogue on a yes or no, we gave them discrete options and then had them pull. And it kept everybody's um, answers, everybody's voices weighted equally in this format. Um, what happened when we did the straw poll is we did a first round of voting. The commission discussed it a little bit more, and then they did a second round and a final poll um, after working out any questions that they had. And this gave us really good direction moving forward. Um, or if we're changing something in the code, we as staff has have, have clear direction for the draft that will then be transmitted to the select board. Um, a second example from form-based code was there is a property um, currently being developed. Um, some of you may know this is where Community Bank and Junior's Pizza are located in Williston. We reminded them of all of the facts and data that went into developing the regulating plan, like existing right-of-ways, state roads, conservation areas, wetlands, easements and utility lines. Um, we hot linked to the relevant testimony so they could easily access the comments they heard during the public hearing. Um, we reviewed the permit history for the property, um, some facts about the acreage, um, showed them the map overlaid on old wetlands data. I actually did this in PowerPoint. I have no Photoshop experience at all. I created all of this stuff in PowerPoint. Um, and notes, and then get, brought them to the question. So we gave them all of these facts in really quick little PowerPoint slides with some voiceover recording, and then asked them, based on all this information, do you want to change the regulating plan map, yes or no? Or do you have another idea? Um, we did a straw poll again, and they decided to, um, initially the vote was 3-3, um, three, three, and then they decided to keep it as is after another discussion. So doing that initial poll gives them the opportunity, okay, we generally know where our seven member board, well, in this case, six attended the meeting. We know where the folks are feeling and we can have our jumping off point for discussion there. Um, next example is the development review board process. Um, 
So staffing the DRB is a big task in Williston. We have um, a lot of meetings um, with big agenda items. Um, this, for example, was the annex, uh, which is going to be um, about 208, uh, or no, 243 dwelling units um, and two apartment buildings. So it's a pretty large development for town. Um, and the staff report is a template that I designed um, based off of an APA article for designing staff reports. So during this um, process, we get citizen comment letters where a lot of times the comment letters are beyond the development review board scope of authority, um, sometimes beyond the scope of a municipal bylaw. So when I get comment letters where there's questions and concerns about traffic, um, this one even goes on to say um, that they would prefer it if DRB would deny a project or hold off on deciding until you know you can do more about traffic, that kind of thing. So when I read a citizen letter, I'm like, oh my gosh, everything's connected. There's so much um, here to share um, about, so much information that can help this person understand um, the decisions and policies that go behind um, development review. Um, and it can be easy to get frustrated with or overwhelmed by citizen comments, but I always remind myself that people want to be helped, heard, or hugged. And we're not actually hugging people, but we're trying to be polite and empathetic um, in our words. So I looked at this comment letter and I'm thinking about what are the principles and standards that go behind traffic studies? Why does Williston have zoning districts? The whole CERC alternative highway and the CERC highway that got canceled in 2011 and its impacts on traffic in the region. Uh, buildings, ho building homes together data, uh, county and local transportation plan, demographic data, uh, due process that applicants are supposed to have their applications reviewed in a timely manner. Um, this is a quasi judicial proceeding reviewing an application. Uh, my staff report template helps to address some of these citizens' concerns. It's a roadmap for the Development Review Board and professional developers and engineers who do this time and time again, but it's also designed for the first time reader. I, someone who's never participated in a development review process, they can understand what's happening, um, the zoning district, the standards of the bylaw that will apply, um, what the recommended action is for the DRB. So they're not shocked when they find out that the development got approved. Um, for each chapter of the bylaw, I have a discussion for the DRB and the applicant. They see at the top standard complies as proposed. Um, for the rest of the chapter, it's discussing um, state highway um standards where, you know, VTRANS supersedes um, local review for their interstate highways. Um, looking at, there was a lot of concerns with this ex application about it connecting through an existing neighborhood. So I brought in that subdivision plat from the 90s for the abutting neighborhood. Um, I discussed what is and is not considered in a traffic study. I linked to the town's traffic calming policy of when speed humps um, or other traffic calming measures are considered on existing road. I excerpted the bylaw. So someone who's never approached our bylaw before, they can see the standards right here. And also for the DRB, they have a quick reference as well if a question comes up in the hearing. Um, this application, I got a lot, or the DRB received a lot of comment letters. Uh, when that happens, sometimes I write a memo um, it's depersonalized. I address it to the development review board, not the individuals. And I respond to a lot of those reoccurring questions and concerns. I always start by summarizing what the DRB's role is and is not. They administer the bylaws. They don't write or revise them. And then I provide links to relevant background information. So there were some misconceptions um, in the public comment about prior approvals. I provide links to those older development reviews. Um, I provide a lot of information about state roads, towns policies on plowing. Um, I even go as far as to link to um, the Metropolitan Transportation Plan and other regional planning documents. 
um, just to help provide citizens with as much information as possible. Even though I can't address all of their concerns, the DRB can't resolve all of their concerns, there's a lot of existing information out there that can help understand um, the topic area that they're concerned about. Uh, Glazer specific plan. Um, so this was a unique zoning process in Williston's bylaw. Um, there's a Williston Observer article out that got repeated in Vermont Digger all about it that came out the other day. Um, it's a process similar to a planned development or planned um, planned unit development review, but it's legislative, where a developer is working with the planning commission on bylaw amendments to support a specific proposal. Long story short, it's complicated. This is my flow chart to help break down all the various steps that go through the specific plan process. Um, this is confusing to me. It's definitely confusing to the average citizen. So I was trying to break it down in a way where folks could understand what's happening along the way and also help the planning commission feel confident that they are following all the rules and procedures to this rarely used zoning process that's codified in the bylaws. Um, anytime a big project or residential development especially is proposed, you know that there's gonna be a lot of citizen interest. This one especially because um, a horse farm was is leasing the land uh, for some of their pasture and hay field. So when that type of thing happens where I know that there's gonna be a lot of public comment, it, rather than just asking for folks to submit comment letters, I like to do it in a survey form. So I can break down, I can get an idea, are people gonna be coming to the community meeting? How many should I be expecting in person and on Zoom? Um, and then I break down the questions. So what are your comments or concerns about the residential development? about the open space. Um, so this project was proposing open space donation to the town. Do you have questions about the open space? Do you have questions about chapter nine where in the public process that is codified in the bylaw or any other questions? So helping break down um, what kind of input I'll be hearing from people. And then I'm able to um, analyze and update an FAQ uh, based on that. So I got 76 survey responses. Um, and I like the survey method for public comment because it gives people time to calmly articulate their ideas and concerns before a public meeting. And I think it, when emotion and um, when emotion and fear of the unknown is tied up in these kinds of things, being able to work through them before being in an in-person meeting really helps um, things go um, more smoothly. Um, setting boundaries with imagery. So throughout those 76 survey responses and five comment letters, there was a repeated theme. Why can't this parcel be developed in, in its in its entirety or conserved in its entirety? Um, could it be developed for more units if this doesn't happen? Um, at the end of the day, the planning commission was going to be having a very narrow focus in their community meeting. And so I wanted to remind people that tonight, we're in the specific plan um, community meeting, this railroad track on the left. And there's all these other railroad tracks like conventional development or land conservation um, that are still theoretically possible. But tonight the focus is the applicant applied for a specific plan. And that's what the planning commission is talking about um, this evening to help, pe help people break down um, all the various potentials that were going on with this land and where the planning commission's focus was gonna be. Um, my fourth example um, is a eclectic mix of infographics that I've come up with over time. Um, this was one that I used for the Glazer specific plan. So the density would have allowed 218 homes, 109 units are proposed. I think I created this either with, um, I think just with PowerPoint and maybe Excel for the grid. Um, so keep it simple. Uh, infographics are, 
they can seem challenging and overwhelming. Um, so keep it simple. Um, and also the, the Coco Chanel saying like, when you go out for the day, look in the mirror and take one thing off. So it's an iterative process. You're going to design something and you'll need to simplify it. Um, here's one that I created to help folks understand the roles and process with development standards. So planning commission proposes the rules, select board approves them, the DRB administers them, and then how the town plan informs what the zoning bylaws will stay and how it's administered through the DRB. Um, I think I created this one in PowerPoint. So really simple, um, kind of dorky looking, but it gets the job done. And I really do think it has had an impact with citizens who are just for the first time approaching a bylaw amendment process or a development review process, understanding how the various entities and town policy documents work together. Um, I use Canva. It is free. You get a little bit more capability with the paid version, which is fairly cheap. Um, which meeting would you prefer to go to, the one on the left or the one on the right? Um, they're both the same meeting. So if something is really important and you want to have people um, interested in it, just a little bit of effort on some graphic design um, and using a pre-template, even in PowerPoint, um, can go a long way. Um, we had another process where there was a development a citizen-driven bylaw request um, to reduce um, or change the amount of open space that our bylaw would require to be set aside in a subdivision. And throughout that process, we were hearing a lot about traffic and schools and sewer and police and emergency services. So we were hearing a lot of concerns, but those concerns wouldn't be addressed by the bylaw amendment that the citizens were asking for. So we were trying to break down what would a minimum percentage open space standard have on, you know, X, Y, Z um, factor. Um, this one came out of our 15 year growth center report. So looking at the new dwellings that were created in different parts of town. Um, and through this iterative process of um, working through the data, Willison's Growth Center is 5% of the land area and 70% of the new homes. So by working through this growth report and analyzing the data, I was able to come up with this really quick bullet point um, that explains a lot of, of information about the town that this very small center um, is where most of the new homes are taking place in town. I can't take credit for this graphic um, or the data that went behind it, but I wanted to share it as well. One of my coworkers worked on this, um, showing that simple projections, how many units would be built in the future? Uh, we hear a lot of concerns about sprawl um, and that the pace of growth is really fast. Um, but what our data is showing is that most of our homes are gonna be in a consolidated area and the rural part of town is gonna to see very few homes um, by 2030. Um, this it shows um, school milestones compared to um, Williston K through eight enrollment numbers. Um, I haven't actually used this table um, in a public meeting, um, but it is helpful. I have use the um, story behind it. So we often hear with development that it's going to have an impact on school population. And we looked at the data of number of homes that have been built in Williston. Um, this is from the census to the number of school children, both existing and projected out to 2030, um, and that there's a difference. Um, and also recently, there's a discussion that the school might have to cut teachers because the student teacher ratio um, is changing with uh, declining enrollment. Uh, this is, and I created this, um, you know, in Excel and then made it look a little bit prettier in PowerPoint. Um, this is a visualization I also created in 
um, PowerPoint. So open space and density, I think that's something that citizens often struggle with understanding, you know, where you have a parcel and then if it's an open space subdivision, it's going to appear denser, but it's still the same overall land area. So helping folks understand density and development standards um, with a simple graphic um, that, that you can make for free in PowerPoint. Um, so one of my mantras is let's get in the car, kids. Um, on the weekends, I also teach skiing with to children. Um, so this philosophy comes in mind there as well, but it's also works with adults and citizen committees. So you're framing the questions to get the desired discussion, not trying to lead anybody to certain answers or outcomes. Um, do you want to get in the car? is going to be a yes, no answer. And a grumpy kid might say no. Um, can you get in the car seat on your own or do you need my help? Gives options, but then you can have a more informed discussion. So framing your questions and framing your discussions rather than should new houses be built, present some data. We know that there's a need for housing in our community and our town plan says that we should um, provide housing for um all people in our community. So where is the best place to do that? And where's not the best place to put new houses and frame the conversation based on facts and based on data um, in, in your town plan um, or other documents um, about your topic area. So for example, we would turn to not only our town plan, the regional um, planning commission documents for Chittenden County, we could look at building homes together. So there's a lot of resources you could look at and then frame questions based on that data that already exists. Um, we did a survey um, once where we framed a question. So you have a hundred homes, where would you put them in town? So we're not asking, do you want more homes in town? We know that the data says that Williston is gonna grow, keep having development pressure. So where would you like to put them in town? Um, and what we found was that, and what we were able to show citizens was that their preferences lined up with the existing policy, that the majority of homes would go in the growth center, some in our remaining sewer service area, and very few homes out in the rural part of town. Um, remind decision makers of prior input. So these excerpts come from our um, form-based code adoption process where we kept track of how many people visit our website and email subscribers, how many hours did the planning commission put into the process, how many survey uh, responses and map comments did we get, how many people attended the meeting. So reminding decision makers of all of the pre- um, the efforts that went into something before it ends up at that final adoption hearing um, and thanking them as well, thanking those citizens and participants who gave their time and hours, um, e even from a couple minutes taking a survey to a planning commission meeting that went over time, um, thanking everybody for their work in that process. Uh, my last example is uh, Williston 2050. So this is our um, headline tag name for writing our next comprehensive plan. Um, I can't take credit for the logo here. We had an iterative process with Leadership Champlain where they worked on some colors and that logo. Um, my boss created that um, font. I think it's just called um, bumper sticker font. Um, and the resilient, livable, equitable came out of, you know, iterative staff conversations about what would a cool tagline be um, for Willis in 2050 and playing around with some like chat GPT examples. Um, this was from uh, 4th of July. Um, some of the creativity comes from you know, practice getting out and talking with citizens in person. This was like the first time I think the planning office had ever had a table at the 4th of July um, talking to citizens about projects. And at this time, uh, it was right before the form-based code was having a hearing with the select board. So it was a really important time to do outreach. 
Um, and it helps get the creative juices flowing, um, talking with people, trying out new ideas. Um, and it was definitely a precursor to thinking about our Williston uh, 2050 engagement. So we had teaser activities uh, last summer. We did our in-person and online big events in the fall. Um, our survey just closed on Monday and we're getting ready to write our town plan. Um, this hangs in my boss's office, do the thing and keep going. So trial, trial and error iterative process um, is what can lead you to um, cool things basically. Uh, this is our website. We built it with Google Sites. You know, we picked our, our leadership Champlain people, picked a couple colors, and we ran with that color palette. We try to keep fonts consistent, reuse the logo. Um, these are PowerPoint icons. Um, I'm not a graphic designer, but it's just pick a couple things, colors and fonts, and, and run with it. Um, this is our Williston 2050 uh, fabric of a new town plan. Um, I can't take credit for it. It was designed by my boss, but it definitely was the result of everybody in our office, you know, brainstorming ideas, talking about cool ways of visualizing things, sharing examples of other communities or articles um, in the planning related world of cool infographics and designs, looking at other town plans. Um, and brainstorming. Um, this are the these are the twelve elements that state law says a town plan needs to talk about, and then the top are our core values. So, how can Williston be livable, resilient, and equitable in the future, um, in twenty twenty fifty and beyond? Uh, so we made it a game. We printed it on a banner at Staples. Got some sticky balls off Amazon. Um, this was also from July 4th. Folks could throw a sticky ball at the, the fabric and see where it landed. So how can, how can transportation be beautiful? Um, how can education be affordable? So just spitballing what comes to mind when you think about that topic area and that adjective. Um, we also did postcards from the future. Um, so folks could fill out a poke a postcard, um, you're writing from the year 2050 back to the present day. So you, you get that space time travel um, imagination going. It's fun with kids. It's fun for adults. Um, and this was, you know, we designed it, I think, in Canva or, or PowerPoint, following those simple colors um, from the beginning. Uh, we did have a consultant that... Um, is working on our Willis in 2050. However, we did most of our community roundtable design and facilitation um, on our own. So provided food, small facilitated groups. Um, the main event was advertised as an hour and a half. And then we had a little bit of buffer time on the beginning end. Um, and we had five topic areas at these events. So um, your facilitated group, you had 15 minutes per topic area. Keeping things quick keeps people um, efficient and um, brief. Um, as part of the activity, we gave folks an alter ego card. So there was one where it's like, I'm a six-year-old kid and I like to ride my bike, um, but the streets are too busy. So getting people to answer the questions and prompts as themselves, but also their alter ego. Um, and I think adults found this to be really fun because you the ones that got like a kid or a teenager were like, oh, I'm 16 and I just got my driver's license and, and could could play around with it. Um, and then we used park it cards. So going back to that original um, park it system we used with our planning commission, we brought this to our in-person events. You know, that 15 minute format per topic is really fast, especially even if you have a small group, um, it's still a lot of voices. So if someone had a question or an idea or thought that, you know, it gets your heart pounding and you want to be able to share it, but it's not really relevant to that quick conversation your group is having, you park it. Um, and we got a lot of these um, as part of our process. Um, 
this one on the right is is I think a good example of what we experience. Um, it says slow down growth, but at the end it says increase affordable housing. So, you know, the juxtaposition that I think people are feeling and our all our communities are trying to work through. Um, so to conclude, um, some words of wisdom that you know, I had in the back of my mind through all these example is really embrace the iterative process. Um, these infographics and quick facts are the result of trial and error, you know, explaining things multiple times, bad first drafts, like some of my PowerPoint slides, even today, I'm like, Ooh, I have too many fonts, um, and working with teammates. Um, I'm always happy to answer citizen questions on the phone or in email. Um, and, and talk through folks multiple times. The more you um, try to understand an idea yourself and simplify it, um, the better you become at telling a story in a really simple way without being dishonest. Because sometimes if you sometimes if you try to distill information, you cut out important facts that are important to the story. So distilling things in a manner that keeps everything um, truthful. Also, um, maintain trust, stay neutral, and show respect. So those are pillars of facilitation. Um, and when a citizen comes to me with a comment or concern, sometimes, often, it's because that has been violated in the past. You know, institutional memory can include past hurts that linger. So where are you rebuilding relationships within a community? Um, and how can you rebuild it with every interaction, whether it's email, phone, or in person? Uh, for example, our historic preservation um, process many years, decades ago, was pretty tough on homeowners where I'll have citizens that come in and they're like, yeah, I had such an awful time and I felt so berated trying to put you know, a little porch on my historic home back in the 90s that I've never wanted to come to the town again to do anything again. And I'm like, well, I hear that. And now I have to recognize, that, okay, this, this person felt this, um, had this bad experience before I was maybe even on the planet. And how can I help them understand that the process um, would be different today? Um, and that if they wanted to do you know, now they want to change the siding on their home. Well, the development standards are different and the the committee operates different than it did back in the day. So remembering that people have come before me um, and I'm always working to help build trust, stay neutral and show respect to uh, my community members. Um, another word of wisdom and my strategy is um, acknowledge, don't ignore. Um, you don't need an answer to everything. You really just need to know how to search for things. And that was a big takeaway for me. Um, we're dealing in our communities with big issues, housing affordability, homelessness, climate change, um, failing infrastructure. It's like, ah, these are really big topics. I don't have the answers to all of them, um, but I know how to search um, the web and search to see what other communities, what other resources are out there um, that can provide facts and provide information to help fill in the gaps <clears throat> um, and provide links to other resources. So we don't have to go reinventing the wheel. We can just help, you know, curate to whoever is asking the question um, and be polite and firm with, but firm with boundaries. So an example, during our form-based code process, there was a citizen that was really concerned about the new zoning standards and future development on the impact of Velco utility lines and the electrical grid, which are something beyond the scope of form-based code and beyond the scope of, you know, where municipalities have authority through zoning. Um, but I recognize that this person's really interested and really passionate. So I explained um, through state law how zoning is superseded um, for utilities. I linked to state and utility companies. They're planning for a resilient grid. A um, lot of resources out there on the state website. Um, and then I also explain, you know, the, I understand that you have these concerns, but they 
they won't be addressed in this bylaw package because we're working on development and design standards that apply to you know, essentially private development. And these utilities are a different entity. Um, and, you know, with those examples with the utility companies, it's like here's or the state um, uh, public services planning processes, like here's where you can direct your questions and comments and have um, more of an impact. Uh, lastly, um, some reading and resources. Um, this article uh, recently came out, five conflict resolution tips to design better meetings. And it's like, oh, this is a lot of the things that I've been doing and working on. Um, it's really helpful. I linked to a Vermont Digger article about open meeting law. Uh, so just make sure that if you're using collaborative documents um, that you're maintaining open meeting law requirements. Um, a lot of it is, you know, decisions and policy conversations should be happening that public meeting. So that planning commission survey, the survey results were filtering to me. I was basing my agenda off of them. And then everything is made publicly accessible. Um, so anyone from the public can see all those survey results. Um, Reaching for Higher Ground um, is an old book, but a good one. And lastly, um, A Planner's Guide to Meeting Facilitation. Um, technically, it costs money, but I think if you Google it, you can find a, a copy out there. Um, and with that, uh, thank you. Uh, let me know if you guys have any questions. Thanks so much, Emily. Um, yeah, so uh, folks that have questions, you can uh, go ahead and either uh, put it in the chat if that's what you prefer, or you can use the raise hand feature, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, I always feel like it's in a different place for me. Um, it is in a different place for me because I'm the host, but um, you can, I if you can't find your raise hand feature, you can just put in the chat that you'd like to ask your question out loud, or of course, anyone can put your question in the chat. Um, but while um, I'm letting you all kind of uh, think it over, Emily, I, and you kind of, um, I mean, I feel like you addressed this pretty well in your presentation, which is why I um, invited you in to speak with us. But I'm just thinking about um, when, you, like the in the kind of groups of, of vocal folks, there's sometimes uh, folks that just are not gonna, um, you know, they're really, like stuck on an idea and they're not going to come around to a yes. And they might be maybe the loudest voice in the room. And I wonder if you can speak to how you uh, direct someone with that kind of intention. Yeah. Um, so ideally I've had time to, you know, chat with them one-on-one -on -one outside of a public meeting where I can understand where their questions or concerns are. Um, if it's a planning commission member um, or a board member, um, fortunately, we're really lucky that um, most our board members are pretty even keeled, but um, I would, I hmm, how do I frame this? I always go back to you know, the policy documents, you know, at the end of the day, um, we're working on town plan goals, we're working on a bigger community vision and try to frame it in that broader fr framework and remind folks that a lot of these concerns and questions, it's usually yes and solutions. There's usually many, many things that need to be done um, in order to, um, have an impact. It's not going to be a one size fits all solution. Um, and that there that there's oftentimes no right answer and kind of remind them that we as communities are working with the tools that we have to affect a change, that there's always, especially with a bylaw amendment, there's time to course correct in the future um, and try to remind them of the bigger context and go back to what are the guiding principle documents that the town has via um, a town plan, regional planning goals, and remind of the bigger picture 
um, that's at play. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's really helpful. I was just checking to see, uh, do you have an example for the decision template? Oh, that's, um, do you have an example for the decision templates? Um, yeah, so with the planning commission, it would be, you know, I, outlining a couple of options of what the bylaw text would be for them to choose from. With the development review board, we're drafting out, you know, findings, conditions, and conclusions for them. Um, if you have a specific question on one, I'm um, happy to help. Or if you want to reach out to me directly, I can link you link you to some decision templates that we've given our our committees. Um, I'll let SJ had to pop off who asked the question, but I'll make sure I convey that information. Do we have other lingering questions? Any comments, big takeaways you want to share? John. Yeah. Um, thanks, Emily. I really loved your presentation. I got to see your boss, Matt, um, present um, at the CATMA Transportation Summit in the fall. And it's just what you're doing in Williston is really cool. Um, cool stuff, I think, particularly as you're envisioning um, kind of trying to retrofit the suburban development pattern into a kind of renovated village, uh, village center kind of concept. And like, the information you provided on, I think, getting the community and on board with it is is awesome, and it's like it's really inspiring to see. But I'm also curious about how you manage to get interested property owners and developers to kind of also get on board with this new plan. I know that in particular, developers or property owners who are used to the sort of suburban development pattern think that you need to have a box store look like a box store and um, and are not interested in you know, having like street forward buildings versus like big parking lots. So yeah, just if you have any tips or just thoughts on, on that getting, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, form-based code was, uh, our, our prior zone, zoning was an iterative um, walkable standard. So it wasn't what we didn't really go from zero to 60. We probably went from like 20 to 60. Um, so the development community was already somewhat familiar with trying to pull buildings to the street. Um, Form-based code definitely kicked it up a notch. Um, working with developers, working with anybody, I really try to be build trust by being straight up about the development standards and how they're going to apply. So whether I'm answering a citizen question about getting a backyard permit shed or how the how I think the DRB conditions are going to fall on a certain type of development proposal, I'm giving them all the answers I can about the bylaw. Like if the Lorax speaks for the trees, then I'm speaking for the bylaw and I'm trying to be as clear and straightforward and fill that trust with the development community where it's like, hey, if you propose that thing to the DRB, it's not going to go so hot. So you should change it to come more into compliance. Um, so really building trust with the development community about how the bylaw standards are interpreted. Um, and then like when you have when you have the trust with um, your community, I think then you can help build the um, interest in, okay, we're going to transition to something that's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be more challenging, but we're trying to achieve a, a certain vision. Williston has a lot of um, cumbersome parts of its zoning bylaw, so I think it's been easier to get our development review community on board because they see the benefit of a simplified permit process you know, more allowed density, more allowed building height. So they do see that there there is a benefit to them as well and the benefit to the community as whole. It's like we need um, more mixed-use buildings. We need more housing. Um, yeah. Thanks, Emily. And I just want to say um, 
Uh, anyone who needs to leave, feel free to leave when you need to. Uh, if there are lingering questions, uh, feel free to uh, send them to my email. Uh, cyant.cvoel.org. You probably have it because I've promoted this workshop. Um, and I just want to say again, thank you, Emily. This was an incredible workshop. I knew it would be. And it um, has so many helpful pieces that um, I have brought up kind of in conversation with um, people working in all different realms of advocacy and the housing world. And so I'm, I'm glad that we now have this workshop as a kind of permanent resource to share with people. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I dropped my email in the chat and I shared my contact info as well. I encourage folks to reach out to me um, anytime. I'm happy to share my tools and tips and tricks and resources um, and help. If you're struggling with an idea and you, you want some feedback, reach out. I'm always here to help our our neighboring Vermont community groups. Thanks, Emily. And thanks everyone for joining.